All right, today we're gonna ask ChatGPT for candle making tips and advice. We might cover some candle business tips and advice as well. So let's just jump right in. And real quick, if you don't know what ChatGPT is, it is an AI tool that helps generate and create content. So uh, I, I won't get into the details of that, but it was all over the internet. It was a big buzz a couple months ago. Um, it's part of this whole new wave of AI. So if you want to learn more about ChatGPT, just Google it, YouTube it or ask ChatGPT, it will explain itself to you. Anyways, we're going to get right into this. I'm going to ask it questions to see what it can come up with, and then we're gonna talk about whether I agree with it, disagree with it, and some context uh, for some perspective. So let's just jump right in. All right, so I'm gonna start off with some questions that I just see all the time in Facebook groups, here on the YouTube channel, uh, you know, other platforms that I'm on, emails that I get. So we're gonna just start with some basics, such as what is the best wax for candle making? Let's see what it gives us. All right, so some of this is kind of long. I'm going to summarize this really quickly, but it starts with when it comes to candle making, the choice of wax depends on several factors, such as outcome, preferences, spe uh, specific requirements. Here are some commonly used ones. Paraffin, soy, beeswax, coconut, and it gives, and palm, and it gives a little bit about um, each of them and what they offer. Then it says at the bottom, ultimately the best wax for candle making depends on your specific needs and preferences. Consider factors such as burn time, scent throw, appearance, cost, sustainability, and so on. All right, so. I was curious just with that question right off the bat if it was going to give a recommendation and I'm actually glad it answered this way because this is the correct answer. There is no best wax and anyone that's been making candles for a while completely understands that because there are so many types of waxes and it just depends on what you're going for when you choose a wax. Just like with any other craft, what is your goal? What matters the most to you? And so, yeah, I actually appreciate this answer. Uh, it, it is a lot of regurgitated information for sure. And that is what ChatGPT does, by the way. It pulls information from all these other different sources. It uses AI to interpret that and then kind of build its own uh, content, its own, its own perspective, and then let you know what that is. So I do appreciate this perspective. I think this was a great answer. Here's the options. Here's some pros and cons of each. It's up to you to decide. So yeah, I'll give that one a thumbs up. What is the best wick for candle making? I'm giving it a few easy ones here to see what uh, how it responds uh, because I'm really curious if it's going to, again, try to tell us what to use or be aware that it depends on the circumstances. Uh, another pretty long one here. Choosing the right wick is essential to ensure proper burning and optimal performance of your candles. The best wick depends on various factors such as the type of wax used, size and shape of the candle, desired burn rate, and then it lists some common ones like cotton core, wooden wicks, flat braid wicks, square braid, zinc core. Now, it did not list specific types of cotton wicks like your Premier wicks like I distribute that you can see below in the channel uh, or CD wicks or HTP wicks or anything like that. It's just telling you the types of wicks like flat braid versus square braid, uh, cord wicks, wood wicks, and so on. Uh, but again, I appreciate the answer. It is telling us that it depends. So I started with these two questions on purpose because it's very, very common to see these questions for brand new candle makers, and it makes perfect sense why they would ask that. That is a normal question for a beginner because they don't necessarily know that it does depend on several factors. So it makes perfect sense that someone would ask that question. However, as you can see, ChatGPT is fully aware that context matters, and it really depends on what other materials you are using in order to determine the proper wick type. If you are a new candle maker and you're watching this and you're curious about different wax types and different wick types and you're not sure which ones to choose or the differences, check out some of my other videos here on the channel. There's a, over 250 now uh, videos now that go into different topics of candle making and running a candle business and so on. I've got videos specifically on wicks, uh, specifically on waxes, and then even some tutorials. So check those out if you're interested and that hopefully will give you some more information. But of course, if you have any more questions, let me know in the comments below and we'll get to it. How much fragrance oil should I use when making candles? Slow. All right, so we're seeing a pattern here, which is it depends. And that is the right way to go about any kind of craft because candle making is yes, a science, but it's also an art. There are things that are scientific about candle making for sure but the processes that everyone use can vary a little bit and you will get different results. Some people will get wildly different results even doing the same process and uh, might get similar results doing different processes. So it really just depends on what you're trying to make with your candles, your environment, the materials you're using. There is an art form combined with science. That's what makes candle making and other crafts so much fun. So when it comes to the amount of fragrance oil being used, it's no different. It's just gonna depend on several factors once again. That is the type of wax being used, 
uh, the, uh, the strength of the fragrance that you're wanting. And if, as you can see here, the type and size of the candle, personal preference, there's a lot of factors, just like when choosing your favorite wax and your favorite wick or the best wick for a type of wax. But it does give you some step-by-step -step process here to also help determine the amount of fragrance to use. If you know what, how much you want to use, what's the best way to figure out that formula? So I have another video here on the channel. I will link it in the, in the video somewhere, maybe down in the description. That is two formulas that are very common for candle making when it comes to figuring out how much you need of every material. And I even talk about my favorite one and go over how it works because it's really important for you as a candle maker to understand how that works, not just using a calculator to do it for you. That way, if you have to make a change on the fly, it's very simple and you understand your products inside and out. But I digress, went off a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, but when it comes to fragrance oil, the amount you use will of course depend. However, there is sort of a general range that most people use, somewhere between 7% and 9%. Some people use 10 or even more depending on the type of wax. In other words, that's the percentage of the total weight of your wax is how much fragrance oil you can use. So if you're using 16 ounces of wax and it can hold 10% fragrance oil, you can add 1.6 ounces of fragrance oil, for example. A lot of people use less than 7%. It just depends on the type of wax the strength of the candle that you want, and also the quality or the just the strength of that oil in general. Some fragrances are stronger than others, so you don't need as much. So again, a lot of factors, a lot of things. As you can see here, a common range is six to 10%. Once again, I agree with ChatGPT here. It all just depends. What temperature should I pour my container candles at? The ideal pouring temperature for container candles depends on the type of wax and other materials you're using. <laughs> Again, you can see a theme here. There's a very specific reason I'm asking the questions that I am because these are very, very common questions that everyone starts with. And it's important to know that context is key. So anytime you're asking questions to others, make sure you're including relevant information for them to help you answer the question because it's not so straightforward. Matter of fact, it will depend on factors. And so uh, I know this isn't the answer a lot of people want to hear necessarily, but this is the truth. It does depend, and I'm actually very happy that ChatGPT is taking this context into account before just giving you some random answer that is not factual. Now, ChatGPT is pulling information from all over the place and using that information to interpret and give you its best results, but it's not gonna be right all the time. It is just regurgitating information that already exists, but the fact that it's aware that it does depend on things, other factors, really is, is a good thing. Uh, that, that's quite impressive. When it comes to pouring your candles, and what temperature you should pour your candles at, or in other words, what temperature should the wax be when you're pouring your candles. Um, if you're brand new to candle making, that is a thing. <laughs> uh, the, the wax will set up differently. Smooth tops, dips, uh, weird looking effects in, in, in craters and sinkholes and all sorts of other aesthetic things that can happen. So it does depend for sure. However, it does give you some decent guidelines here. At least it breaks it down by general wax type. For example, it says soy wax should be poured between 120 and 150. I'd say that's a pretty good estimate. I like to pour soy wax and soy blends lower, as low as I possibly can and get away with it because I've had personal better results when doing that, at least with the wax blends that I've used. Some people will pour hotter because it works better for them. Paraffin wax at list here next is poured hotter between 160 and 180. I know people that pour closer to 200. Again, that's a general range and I would generally agree with that range, but it will depend. Beeswax, blended waxes, and so on, it gives you a few other recommendations, but long story short, start with the manufacturer recommendations or the supplier, what they suggest you do, or at least try, see how that goes, and if you need to adjust, then adjust. It's really not that big of a deal. I am a candle maker. How do I color my candles. As a candle maker, there are various methods you can use to color your candles. Here's some common techniques. It says liquid dye, dye blocks or chips, powdered dye, and pigments. So liquid dye is my favorite. Um, it's the most concentrated usually, but I just find it the easiest to control the amount that you want to use. Dye blocks and chips are also very, very popular. And then you see powdered dye and pigments. Make sure you're just buying and using ones that are specifically made for candle making. Um, I again agree with this list. I'm also impressed that it didn't mention crayons because a lot of brand new candle makers were assumed that that's uh, a, a normal way to color your, your candles because they are a wax and they're colored already, so why not? Well, the difference is, is they are not a colorant by themselves. They're already mixed with the wax and you don't know what that wax is. It's not the same wax you're using. It can work, but it might have a weird odor, might smell, it might clog your wick. Just use dyes meant for candle making and you'll have much better results. All right, let's ask some business questions, see what it comes up with. How much does it cost to make a candle? Now, I know. A lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, that's a stupid question. It's gonna depend on a lot of things. You're right, but let's see how ChatGPT handles that. Cost of making candle will depend on several factors. 
Recurring theme here. Uh, let's see, it is going to depend on the quality of ingredients, uh, the type of ingredients, the size and si style of the candle, the packet materials, scaled production, and so on. Which again, that's, that's a great key. So if you're a brand new candle maker, you're buying your materials in small amounts, right? So it's gonna cost you more. Once you scale your production, you buy in larger quantity, larger bulk, larger volume, so your prices come down. Your costs come down to make your product. And that's, uh, that's true across pretty much every industry out there. So that is an important note. As a new candle maker, it generally costs you more to make your product than it will later. That is referred to as your cost of goods, your cost of goods sold. So that is an important number to know because it helps you price your candles, right? And we'll talk about that uh, maybe, actually maybe next. Maybe that'll be the next question I asked ChatGPT. So, uh, but besides production, you have to consider the cost of the materials themselves anyways. So your wax, uh, your wicks, your fragrance oil. Well, let's start with wax. Wax prices range drastically. You can get wax as low as a buck fifty a pound. You can get waxes that are like $4 a pound. It just really depends on what type you want to use. Is cost more important to you or is a certain characteristic of a wax more important to you? So the cost of wax certainly goes into the cost of your overall product. Wicks, not so much. It's a pretty minuscule cost. Wooden wicks cost more, but for the, generally speaking, other wicks cost you pennies. It's really not a huge cost. Fragrance oil is a big cost though. You can find fragrance oils that cost anywhere around $20 a pound up to $75 a pound or even more. So again, where you're buying your materials, the quality of the materials you're using, the preferences you have for those materials, all of these all of these contribute to the overall cost of your candles. And then of course your containers, are, are you going with something simple or are you going with something elegant, something luxury? Packaging, are you going cheap and making it economy so you can just get your products cheaper to your customers? Or is branding and packaging part of your theme, part of your brand, part of your story? So again, all of these factors contribute to it. Long story short, there's no way to say how much a candle should cost to make or does cost to make until you know all of these factors. So once you've made your candles, take these costs, break them down per unit. So if you can get all your supplies and you make 20 candles, divide the total cost by 20, and that should help you give a rough idea. Now you should factor other things in like miscellaneous supplies, again, packaging, uh, factory overhead, things like that, uh, labor if you're hiring help, but that's usually not the case early on for most people. So keep it simple, stick to the cost of the materials you're using, and uh, that'll give you a rough idea. Then you can just kind of improve that as you go. All right, so I just mentioned something about pricing and selling your candles. So how about we go with how much should I sell my candles for? All right, it's going too quick here. Stop, stop, stop. Determining the selling price of, uh, where'd it go? Of pricing your candles involves considering several factors. Once again, cost of production, desired profit margin, market demand, competition, perceived value, and so on. Again, we just talked about calculating the cost of your products. So I'm not gonna go into that one again, but your wax, your wicks, your jars, your fragrance, your packaging, all of that. But then there's desired profit margin. How much do you want to profit as part of your selling price, as part of every sale. Uh, you need to research the market. In other words, how much can you sell your product for? Here's the cost of your product, here's how much you wanna make, but what can you actually sell it for in the market? What are people willing to spend? Which goes to perceived value, your target audience, and, uh, and so on. So all of these factors really do go uh, into determining pricing. And then last, it mentions a good tip, which is testing your pricing strategies. So don't be afraid to test different price points and see which ones work. And then also tracking your profitability and make sure that you stick with something that's optimal. So don't let this overwhelm you if you're new to this and new to business. Keep it simple at first and make tweaks as you go. You can just start with, I know roughly what my candle costs and I want to price it for this to make roughly this profit. That's fine and you can tweak as you go. But knowing these other numbers, these other factors will really, really help you make sure that you're priced optimally. And as a business, especially one that's growing, that is something that you do want to focus on the best you can. I'm constantly tweaking things myself. So that's a part of doing business and it's totally normal not to get it right the first time. In fact, most, no one does. So anyways, uh, once again, agree with chat GPT here. Uh, of course, there's several things that can go on and on and on, but generally speaking, I think this is, once again, pretty good information here. Now, speaking of candle making and candle business, I know a lot of people here are considering getting into candle making or a related craft, if you're not already. And many of you are probably thinking about branding, like labels or logos, especially if you do intend on selling your candles and starting this either as a part-time or full-time business. So if that is something that interests you, you could certainly ask ChatGPT for some tips to get started, or you can head on over to Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video. If you are unfamiliar, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on various topics, including business, websites, DIY, bookkeeping, marketing, branding, photo and video, and much more. All at your fingertips, anytime, and unlimited. 
So if this interests you, head on over there, browse their huge selections, even if it has nothing to do with candles. But I would suggest you might want to check out this one called DIY Branding for Beginners. Design a unique logo using Canva by Nisha V. She goes into incredible detail while also keeping it very simple and easy to follow. She helps with the basics of an effective logo, like colors, fonts, even gives you some examples, how to design and edit, exporting your logo for use. Now, I've been doing this for a decade and I still found value in this class alone, not to mention all the other videos on Skillshare that I refer to quite frequently. But again, if branding and designing a logo isn't something that interests you or that you don't really need help with, again, they have tons of great topics and it's all unlimited. So again, if you're interested, check out Skillshare. It's a fantastic resource and the first 1,000 people to click on the link in the description and at the pinned comment below, get a free one month trial to Skillshare. Now back to asking ChatGPT some more questions. All right, how many candles should I take to a craft show? That's a question I get all the time. And my answer is, I have no idea because I don't know anything about the craft show, how much traffic's gonna be there, how many products you sell in general. This is not something I, I'm an expert at. I do craft shows, I do well at craft shows, but I always run out of stuff and have to bring stuff in the next day. So it's a tough one. And I think before I even read their answer, experience is gonna be the best key here, the best help. But let's see what it says. Um, how, many, how many candles to take to a craft show? Uh, you need to consider things like the duration of the event your sales goals, the size of your booth and a display area, your inventory management strategy. See, these are better answers than I was giving. The size of your booth really, really is important. You can only take what you can store and, and display unless you have some other arrangement where you can keep them somewhere else as kind of like a backfill. Um, but at least have some, like if it's a multiple day show, know that you've got some back that you can bring the next day if you really need to. Um, I say the first time, just bring several things. You don't want to overwhelm yourself, but bring a decent enough supply so you can figure out what people are liking. Learn from the first couple experiences. And then future shows, you'll have a much better idea of what to bring, how much of each. Again, been doing this for over a decade. I'm still learning from every single craft show. But like I said, it, it says research in the event. Um, you know, you need to know your sell goals, your, your booth space, evaluate past sales data. Um, once again, just plan, planning for the show based off of previous shows is really the best tip here. So I think, once again, this is pretty good advice. There is a lot more information. There's tips galore out there about how to run a craft show. I've got two or three videos on my channel alone that show you behind the scenes of my craft shows. I'll try to remember to link those as well, but uh, you can definitely find them just browsing my videos. Uh, but again, just experience and learning is, is really the best, but this is great information. It really is good information. But as you can see with all the other answers and questions so far, there is not a single straightforward answer. Welcome to the world of business. Welcome to the world of DIY and other crafts. You're not gonna find a necessarily a right answer to every question. And that's okay, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes this unique experience for everyone. Should I, all right, another question I get all the time is should I even start a candle business? I don't know why I put even in there as if I was like talking to a person already. Uh, let's see. Here are some considerations to help you make an informed decision. Passion and interest. This is a big one we talk about on the channel, and I've done a couple collaborations where we focus on this as well. I do think if you're getting in a business something, you're, there should be a focus on profit, right? Like that's the point of running a business, but it makes it a lot easier to stay committed, not get burnt out, and enjoy the process if it is something you're passionate and interested in already. In fact, I've got videos that talk about how I got in candle making and what sparked that interest. It's kind of a funny story if you want to check it out. But uh, that, that drive, that, pa that passion, that interest will help drive you and drive your business and your motivation. Uh, market demand. Uh, yeah, you need to know if there is a market for your products. I can safely tell you that there is a market for candles, so that should ease your mind. But if you have a theme or a niche-based candle business or candle idea, you might want to try to research that and see if there is uh, a demand for that. Uh, unique selling proposition. Is there anything that makes your products different from others? Maybe the scent you're using, the colors, the look of your product, your labeling, your packaging, your theme in general. Again, I've done videos about themes. Very, very important thing that I think can really boost a lot of people's businesses. Startup costs, budgets, time commitment, all of that. So in other words, can you stick to it? If things start going well, do you have the, the, the means, the capability to stick with it and scale if you really need to? So scalability and growth potential, these are all things you wanna consider. Those are usually good problems to have, but like I tell people all the time, good problems are still problems. You still gotta know how to deal with them. Risk tolerance, is this something you wanna start on the side and then let it grow, just see what it develops into? Or are you wanting to just like quit and jump right into it? Well, I don't really recommend that with anything. I think you, you know, wanna kind of play this smart, play it safe, but risk tolerance is certainly a factor. 
when you want to decide whether to start a business. And of course, like I've been mentioning with every topic, several videos on this channel that talk about starting a business and how I would do it uh, right now versus in tips and strategies to do so. So check this out if you'd like more detail. All right, so I have one more question that I want to get to, and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. All the questions so far have been very specific, asking a very specific question. And I intentionally asked questions that I knew there's not a yes or no, right or wrong answer, because I wanted to see how it would handle that advice. But now I'm going to ask it more of an open-ended question and to see if it can give me more of a, a strategy, a plan. I'm just really curious what it comes up with. And that, is, and that is, how do I make container candles, for example? Let's just see what it tells us. Notice this one's taking it longer to think of an answer. <laughs> All right, here we go. Making candles involves a step-by-step -step process that includes preparing the container, melting the wax, adding fragrance and color, setting the wick, and allowing the candle to cool and solidify. Pretty good summary. Here's a general guide to making container candles. Materials you'll need. Candle wax, even gives you a few examples. Candle wicks, fragrance oil, candle dye if you want it. Containers, a double boil or some way to melt your wax. A thermometer, a stirring utensil, wick stickers or hot glue, a wick centering device is optional. Heat resistant surface or wax melting pitcher and protective equipment. All right, they may have left a few things off there. I'd honestly have to think about it, but I, I don't know. That's a pretty good list. Like, it quickly came up with a, a pretty good solid list of materials a beginner would need to get started. Then it goes into a step-by-step -step process. I'm not gonna read these word for word, but I'm gonna summarize them. Uh, prepare the container, which looks like it includes cleaning and wicking the container. Number two, melt the wax. Number three, add fragrance and color. Four, pour the wax. Five, set the wick. Keep the wick straight and centered by using a wick. All right, so I would have, uh, that's something I would disagree. I would have your wick set first and I'd use a hot glue, that's wick stick or something like that to secure it to the jar. Um, then pour your wax in and then use a tool to help keep the wick centered. I've got tools to talk about on the channel all the time from Norton Candle Supply. Those are the ones I use the most. Um, they'll be linked below. You can check them out. Um, and then after that, trim the wick after the candle's cooled. And then optional, if you want to label the candor, candle, lid the candle, and then sell it, of course, if that's your optimal goal. Or just burn it yourself. Very, very high level, very non-specific, generic instructions, but that's a pretty good, in a nutshell, how you make a candle. Of course, there's a lot of nuance to it. We all know that. That's why there's 270 videos on this channel and a bunch of other resources that exist as well, helping people make good candles. However, this is a pretty good summary. In fact, if we really wanted to, we could ask ChatGPT or any other resources to dive into more detail on each one of these. For example, number three is add fragrance and color. If we wanna know more about that, we could simply say, how much fragrance should I use? Well, we already did that. Uh, how should I calculate the fragrance to use? And uh, honestly, after you get past the generic stuff, I'd stop using something like this. I would go to people that have done it before, YouTube videos like this, Facebook groups, forums, anything that you can get real help and more guidance from people that have actually done it. But this is pretty good. Really hard to argue with it. I was kind of expecting to get a bunch of answers to questions that I just flat out disagreed with. And that was going to be more fun for me. I'll be honest. I, I was looking to disagree with chat GPT. Either way, I wanted to keep this real. And so while I was looking forward a little bit to arguing with uh, AI a little, uh, this was still fun and it was enlightening actually. I thought it did a good job of pulling relevant information all over the place and interpreting it and giving us some pretty good information back. So let me know what you think about these results or if you have some other questions that you think would be great to ask it or to dive into in future videos, let me know in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up if you guys enjoyed it at all. I, I really enjoy making these videos for you, uh, but I also don't know which ones you guys like. So if you give me a thumbs up, I know that you liked this video. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that as well. I release videos at least weekly and I don't want you to miss any. So the best way to not do that is subscribe to the channel. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget to check out Skillshare in the description below. The first 1,000 people to use that link get a free one month trial of Skillshare. With that being said, check out this next video and I'll see you all next time.